identified the chiral centers for our molecule. Now, since we identified the chiral centers for our molecule, now what we're going to do, since we got the chiral centers, and also we have the absolute configuration, which is SS, what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, take this molecule and we're going to the best of our ability attempt to uh, draw the epimer of it. Now first, before we draw the epimer, you have to understand what the epimer is. Now, let's say for instance that this was the original, original. And the reason this is the original is because this is what they originally gave us. The molecule that they originally gave us. Now, if you have any original stereoisomer, what you can do is take the stereoisomer, and if you wanted the epimer of it, then what you do to get that is you have to take from the original, you have to change one of the chiral centers in the molecule. That's the definition of what an epimer is. Now, of course, that's the definition of what, what an epimer is, but uh, let's actually apply that knowledge. Now, the thing is this. You know that in our molecule, in our original molecule, you know we had two chirality centers at two and three. Now, the thing is, we can draw two epimers from this molecule. We can draw what they call a C2 epimer, or we can draw a C3 epimer. And what a C2 epimer is, all that it means is, uh, at, at the C2 in this molecule, instead of it being S, we're going to change it to R. And that is the very definition of what an epimer is, because epimer tells us we only can change one of the chirality centers. So to, from the original to get the epimer, you have to pick either two or three and change it to R. You have to pick only one, though. And this is why I say at the C2 position, that's why if you change the C2 position to R and you leave the three at S, that'll be a C2 epimer. And also, if you take the, uh, at the C3 position, if you, if you uh, take the, uh, the S and you change it into an R, then it'll be a C3 epimer. And it, it's only because you took, at the C3 position, you took that, uh, that configuration and you inverted it. And that's what I mean by change. When I say change, you have to invert the configuration. So let's just do an example of one. If we, so if we had this original compound right here, this uh, fluorine compound, and let's, so let's draw it. It looks like uh, this. So let's say we had this, this fluorine compound right here. This is a fluorine compound we got. Now, of course, you know that's one, two, three, and four right there. Now, that's our fluorine compound. Now, and we know that in our fluorine compound that this is SS. That's S, that's S. Now, uh, to get the uh, C2 epimer, and we might as well just draw both epimers. They only told us in the problem to draw one epimer, but we're going to just do two just for the hell of it. So this will be the C2 epimer, and this one right here will be the C3 epimer. Okay, now, okay, so right off, you're going to have to draw the same general structure here. But the big difference is, at the 2 position, now 1, 2, 3, 4, and we're going to do the same thing up here, 1, 2, 3, 4. Now, the thing is, you got to understand this. At the 2 position in this molecule right here, this now is going to be R, because it got epimerized, or it, it got inverted, because that's what epimer is. You have to pick one, and you have to switch it backwards. You have to change only one position to get the epimer. So this is a C2 epimer, and if we change this to R and keep this S, S is still going to look the same. The, uh, the solid and the dashed line is still going to look the same, because the, com uh, the configuration didn't change, so it's still going to remain the same, where you have a, a solid colored uh, fluorine and a dashed hydrogen. Now, where the R is for number two, this is going to be backwards now. Or what I mean is the solid now is going to be hydrogen and the dashed line is going to be fluorine to make this the epimer. Same thing for this one. Uh, uh, notice this is a C3 epimer, so two is going to remain the same. So that's an S, that's an R. This is backwards from uh, the C2 epimer. S, this, this, one, this S is still going to remain the same. Fluorine is still going to be on the solid line. The dashed line is still going to be hydrogen. Now, in contrast, up here, this R is going to be backwards. The, the R is going to be backwards from the S, which means that on the solid line, you're going to have a hydrogen. On the dashed line, you're going to have a fluorine. So in this way, we just drew uh, two epimers of our original molecule. In the last video, we uh, spoke all about compound A, and we, talk, we looked at how uh, the two chiral carbons uh, had certain uh, configurations associated with them. And uh, specifically what I mean is, I mean that carbon right there. And this carbon right here, we looked at those two and we found in the previous video that those two were both S. So we can write that in there now.
You know, uh, of course, both of those are s. Uh, but now what we have to do is look at this b here, this compound b. And uh, when we look at compound b, we have to find certain things about it, out about it. And uh, what I mean is we have to figure out what the configuration is if it's r s. First off, does it have any chiral, chiral carbons? And uh, compound B does have one chiral carbon. It's right there. It's right there. It's that carbon. And uh, we, we're gonna, what are we going to have to do in this video is we're going to look at compound B. We're going to figure out what the configuration of that carbon is. Is that carbon R or is it S? And uh, also we're going to look at it and we're going to see uh, once we figure out if it's R S, we're going to figure out how to get to the anatomer of compound B. So that's really going to be the focus of this video. We might get a chance to go into uh, compound C. Uh, to see what the R, C, uh, it also has two car chiral carbons right there and right there. And uh, we're, we're trying to see here, does uh, these two chiral carbons, we want to see are they R, R or S. And we also want to see what the constitutional isomer is for com compound C. So let's start by focusing on compound B. So we'll redraw it. We have to first draw the amide. This oxygen has two lone pairs. We have a nitrogen here. And we have a chain. We have an OH there. And in the chain we have uh, the chiral carbon there. That, that, that chiral carbon. And uh, I'll draw these two groups in two colors. We'll draw the OH in blue. And we'll draw the hydrogen in orange. Okay? So uh, the only reason I draw these in different colors is because this is the only thing of interest really in the entire compound. Because we're specifically focusing, focusing on chirality, and we want to uh, see what if that compound is R S. So let's start by doing that. So if we uh, take a look at this compound, if we uh, zoom in, as I like to say, we zoom in, we can see that the oxygen is going to be right there, and the hydrogen, the orange hydrogen, is right there. And the reason we, we focus on this orange and this blue so much is because uh, this orange and blue determine if the compound is going to be R or S. Uh, and uh, specifically, when you're ranking the priorities, uh, this is what I mean. Now, in this compound, we have our orange and our blue here, but above it, we have our carbon that's doubly bonded to oxygen, and this carbon is also connected to nitrogen, and the one below it is a carbon that's connected to two hydrogens, and it's also connected to an oxygen. Now, uh, that's our chiral carbon right there, and uh, we have to rank the priorities. So uh, when we rank the priority of this compound, we can see that that's going to be number four, that's going to be number one. And specifically, when we rank priorities, in the previous video we talked about it, we talked about how we rank priorities based off atomic number. So this is how we're going to go about doing it. Now, you can see we have two carbons, this carbon and that carbon. Uh, they're the same atom, so of course, like in the last video, if it's the same atom, you have to um, go to the next thing in line that's connected. And what I mean is, you have to look at uh, these atoms and these atoms right here. That's what's really important here. And uh, if, you're, um, if you're doubly bonded to the carbon, it's like you're being uh, connected twice. So instead of it being one oxygen bonded to this carbon, there's two. And then uh, connected right here is that nitrogen. And then right here you have a situation where you have hydrogen, oxygen, and uh, hydrogen. And if you write all the atomic numbers, hydrogen is one, oxygen is uh, eight, I believe. Hydrogen is one, nitrogen is... Uh, well, this oxygen is eight. This oxygen is eight. This oxygen, this nitrogen, I know it's greater than uh, six. So we're just going to say uh, this nitrogen, the atomic number is greater than six, whatever it is. So we can see that if we look at these, this eight, this one, and this one, it's going to be less if you add all these numbers together than eight, eight, and six. So this is a higher priority above it. So this priority here is going to be priority number two, and down here is going to be three. So we're going to clean, let's clean that up so we can see, see it a little better. Clean it up. If you clean it up, we write it, it looks like one, four, two, and three. Uh, now we're going to do the swapping technique where when I swap, I didn't mention in the last video, if I swap, the whole point of me is to get the four on the top. Now, of course, you know, I always draw a cross. Now, there's four uh, points on a cross, the top, the bottom, left, the left, and the right. Now, I want to get the four on the top of the cross. That's the whole point of me swapping this, because uh, this is just the technique that we use to determine if it's going to be R S. Uh, if I swap the four to put it on top with the two, whenever I swap the four, I have to swap these two numbers also. So uh, once I swap, 
This is the swap technique. You swap. Uh, now you're in a situation where uh, the numbers are going to be 4, 2, 1, and 3. So now we can bring our uh, marker in. And we can see that goes from 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 1. That is in the, as we talked about in the last video, this here is in the R confirmation because it goes like a, a clock on the, uh, the hand clock. And if it goes backwards, it goes counterclockwise or backwards to the clock, this is considered to be S. But this is R. So this compound is going to be R. And uh, uh, we have to finish this, com finish this problem. Well, we have to finish this part B of the problem by writing the enantiomer, writing this molecule as an enantiomer. And what I mean by enantiomer, enantiomer is a stereoisomer. And uh, we'll define what enantiomer is. So we're going to do the enantiomer. I'm going to write just a... Uh, abbreviation of enantiomer. <laughs> so uh, what is an enantiomer? Let's talk about that real fast. It's not going to be very complicated. So an enantiomer, it's okay. If you Now, we already talked about this in the previous video, but anytime I explain what these stereoisomers are, you have to always look at the original, and this is our original right here. Uh, and specifically, the original is what you originally start with. Now, if this is the original right here, you know that uh, you're going to have to... Uh, to get the enantiomer from the original, the formula is the enantiomer is equal to swap all chirality centers. So that's the formula for uh, to get the enantiomer from the original of any type of molecule. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to swap all chirality centers from the original to get the enantiomer of the original. So again, if we have this molecule, let's draw the same one. But because uh, of course you know this stuff right here is really kind of insignificant. We only want to focus on the colored part, so we can just draw this part really fast because it really doesn't matter so much. But now notice, notice how it's R right here in the original. To get the enantiomer, I have to swap all the chirality centers. This molecule only has one chirality center, so I only have to swap just this one chirality center. So now it's going to be S. Uh, and also, if I swap that chirality center, now this blue and this orange thing in it that were so important in this part, uh, they're going to uh, swap also. Because whenever you swap the chirality center, the letter from R to S or S to R, you also have to, in what they say, invert the configuration. Or you just have to swap, make these backwards. You're going to put it in simple terms. Let's stay away from that complicated stuff. So just put the orange over here and the blue over here. So notice how the orange is on the left over here. Now it's going to be on the right over here. And now the blue is going to be on the left over here instead of being on the right. It's just opposite. And you know, this is, I mean, you, if you want to go into more detail, you can get a, a textbook definition. I'm just trying to show you how to uh, <laughs> get, get these problems right. So, uh, but basically, but, but basically that's what the definition, the book definition of what an enantiomer is. It's a non-superimposable mirror image. And this is the swap. Really, when I invert these two or I just make them backwards, that's the mirror part because I just take this one and I make the mirror image over here because it's backwards. That's why it's inverted configuration, R-S-S-R. -S -S -R.